Assalamu alaikum everyone. Okay, so my name is Khadija Siddiqui and I am a student of final year LLB. I'm doing it in Lahore from Blackstone School of Law. And um, I'm going to start with the theme because it's a very impressive theme, Aaj Ke Naam. And uh, is the mic working? Can you hear me everyone? Okay. So, Intasab, Aaj Ke Naam. It's a very soulful, thought-provoking poem written by our very brilliant, I would say, Faiz Ahmed Faiz. It illuminates uh, the idea of pain and disruption in our society. Intasab is a dedication, a dedication to the numerous attempts of valor and honor that go unnoticed in the daily humdrum of life. I feel in Tasab, it's a very, very thoughtful and you know thought-provoking uh, poem. And um, like Fez, I believe our nation is built with the wealth, and our nation is extremely powerful. We have the power to change this nation. I see simplicity and strength. I see love and courage, hope and agility. Yes, our nation is definitely full of this. But at the same time, I feel somewhere down the lane, Somewhere down the lane, this stronghold gets destroyed before it reaches its full potential. It does. Don't get me wrong, um, it's not a gloomy stance that I am endorsing. I am merely speaking to the disruptions, to the interruptions that come along like tides and they wash away the forts that people are trying to build. These are the interruptions, the unpredictable pain that people have to suffer at the hands of their fellow human beings. The unpredictable pain, yes, at the hands of our fellow human beings. These disruptions that cause chaos and never flinch. So my story begins, I always, say this, that we need to ask ourselves, are we a cause of pain or disruption in our society? Am I a cause of pain in my home, in my society? Or am I trying to build a fort? This is a question we need to ask ourselves. And we as responsible members, as responsible citizens of the Republic of Pakistan, we need to ask these, we need to address these questions and we need to find solutions. So like I just mentioned, like I just mentioned about uh, humans falling to the level of beasts and um, causing pain to each other, my story revolves around that. So um, all of that happened on 3rd of May 2016. As a matter of my usual routine, I had gone to pick my younger sister, aged six, who at that time was six, and she is sitting uh, with us, amongst us. Um, I had gone to pick her up from her school convent, and uh, my car was parked um, at a considerable distance from the school because of the uh, traffic congestion and the traffic jams. So my car was parked around five to six minutes dist walking distance from the school in front of Ambassador Hotel. So, um, I had picked her up and I was on my way back and um, I made my, as a matter of my usual routine, I always make my younger sister sit the car before me. So as I did so, and as I was about to make my way into the car, I was suddenly propelled onto the back seat uh, with immense force, something that seemed to be like uninterrupted gashes with full force. And in that moment, I could hear my younger sister screaming 
in pain and agony. In, try, in an attempt to rescue me, she got stabbed too. So 23 continuous stabs, and I was lying on, in the middle of the Davis Road, immersed in a pool of blood. And at that time, I thought, this is it, end of life. I recited the Kalma, and I thought, there is no turning back to life now, no way. You know, because it was such a horrendous act of continuous stabbing that there were no chances, extremely bleak chances of any survival. Had my driver not intervened that uh, I would call him a beast because humans can't do something like that to a human and other humans. So had my driver not intervened, uh, he would have completely killed me. And actually, he did think that he had successfully killed me. And he ran back, fluttering his knife in the air, thinking that he'd killed me. So my driver shifted me and my younger sister, who were in a horrible uh, state, he shifted us to services hospital. And over there, I got treated. My, the doctors said that, you know, it's a miracle that you're alive. Stab wounds on the neck, on the entire of your back. It's a miracle that, you know, you're being treated and you're alive. So I remember once uh, this man in, this, uh, in services hospital, he came to me and he said, do you remember me? And I said, no, I can't recall. And then he said, I came to you on the first day, and you were in a horrible state. And they were, I actually thought that you weren't alive. But it's a miracle that you are getting better and you are recovering. So you know, God plans. And the perpetrator who planned to attack me, his plan was overturned. And I'm standing right here in front of you. So in the hospital, um, I was treated um, 200 stitches all across my neck with, um, I think you can see them on the slideshow, and my ne across my neck, it was like a um, crossword puzzle. On my neck, my entire arm, it somewhat played a defensive role, you know, and I probably tried to save my neck or somewhat. Uh, it just got completely injured, my right arm, my back, it had uh, CSF fluid leakage in my backbone. So I had to undergo surgeries for that too. And um, it was completely life-changing, a life-threatening experience for me. And after that, when I returned home and um, life continued, but in a very different way. Because I realized the man who attempted to kill me, who attempted to murder me, needs to be brought to justice. Initially, I, it was just my fight. And I thought that, you know, I need to roam around in the society freely. And man who commits such a heinous act of murder needs to be brought to justice. So, you know, it was my fight. I wanted to feel safe again in the society. And I wanted to fight my own case, because being a law student, I couldn't, you know, sit back and hold back and give in. So um, initially, when this uh, journey started, it was my dad, my brave-hearted dad, you know, whose strength, who used to go to the courtrooms. There would be a huge lawyer's club out there threatening him, intimidating him. You, are, you give up. You know, you don't know. We believe, because the... Unfortunately, the perpetrator was uh, my class fellow in uh, the law college. He was a lawyer's son. So he had the backing of the uh, major chunk, I would say, the, all the black sheep of the legal fraternity, who were supporting him and who would chant slogans in the courtroom saying, and they wanted to do every single thing to save that boy from punishment. And they did for the entire year. They would harass us, threaten us in the court that, you know, leave this. It's a matter of your daughter. Think about her future. Such comments coming from the family. Then, you know, move on with life. Go, go abroad, study. Why do you want to stay here? It's a, uh, you know, it's a threat to your life. 
don't take this risk. You know, there's this huge party standing against you. Why are you even uh, risking? Why are you even putting your future at stake? So, during that entire time, my parents, my immediate family, my father is also sitting there, who I remember used to stay up all night drinking a glass of coffee. Enemy has lost by the ball, and that's exactly what happened when my voice got heard. 
Shahzeb Khanzada from Geo. He was the first one actually, to, you know, take up my story. And he said that, check this out, the girl who got attacked by this um, hooligan is going to appear for the examination of law, sitting in the same examination hall, sitting under the same roof, giving an exam after attempting murder. So that, you know, triggered the entire media. People started writing about it, people started talking about it. And that's when actually I did get hope for justice because this DJ of the Lahore High Court said, Mansoor Ali Shah, God bless him, because had it not been for the notice that he took, the 30 day trial notice, the trial would have never been completed because the trial had started for the whole year. So this trial started exactly at, uh, I remember it was 7th June, 2017. And that's when, and by the way, because of that media, I know that hype, even his examination hall got shifted. The city got shifted, actually. Because everybody was, people were mailing British arms because they were saying that we do not want to sit with this. We feel threatened. We, feel threatened. we don't want to sit in the same hall as the attacker who attacked our fellow um, sister. So, um, because of that, I saw the power of the youth. I saw the power of people. They just signed a petition. And I think uh, many thousands of students and people across the world signed that petition and because of that, the center was changed. And before that, I was getting calls from the British on the same that it's just a very last moment uh, change of plan. We, don't, we can't really change the center now because the exam is just right around the corner and, you know, it's going to be impossible. I said, they said, you can come to our British on the center and we will, you will be tested over there. You will be the only one giving the exam there and, you know, uh, you can give it very safely with it. So I said, why should I be the one suffering? Why should I be the one giving the paper alone? Why not the one who attacked me? Why is he roaming around? If, if, if you want to isolate someone, isolate the man who attacked me, not me. Do not isolate me. So I said, if he can stay, I can stay. So after that, after the exams, the trial started on the 7th of June, and um, you will all be surprised. It was uh, not a trial for the, uh, you know, to recompense for my ghastly wounds. It was probably a trial of my character. It was a trial of my patience. It was a game of my history. It was playing with my soul. What happened on uh, the 13th of June of July, yeah, it was my cross-examination. And the courtroom was roiling with men hired by the opponent, the defense counsel, to stand behind me and to laugh and giggle as soon as they threw a scandalous question at me. So all they did was, all, the entire defense was based on the fact the girl's character is questioning. She is an immoral girl. This was their defense to an attempted murder. They were just waiting for me to faint, to give up, to say that, you know, I cannot take these questions, I am leaving. They were waiting for this time. They were waiting desperately. They were saying, Ab to, ab to haat hoi bhi, ab to kai bhi, mein nahi sun sakti. Itne log khade rin, jis sare mart hai, jokai hat se hai, aur unko koi rok bhi nila, because they have the, uh, although there was media during the trial, the media would be standing outside, but they leave for this. They fell to every extent, every, they fell below the belt, you know, they, Rotten base mentality you have. The entire trial, they just proved one thing. They couldn't prove that that boy was innocent. They couldn't prove that uh, that attacker didn't attack me on 3rd May 2016. The only thing they proved was their rotten base mentality. Was their masculinity. You know, that deep rooted uh, patriarchy that's embedded in us. So I thought that. This is the defense. I couldn't actually, you know, um, I couldn't walk my head. I couldn't contemplate the entire defense. So I would just wrap it up. Things happened, and you know, um, the historic conviction came on 29th of July 2017. That was when he, the son of a lawyer, whom they thought had impunity, and he was about to law, he got sentenced for seven years. So my all of you is that as you have seen life doesn't end with the brutality 
of the male oriented mindset. It just begins when a woman is strong, strong enough to undo evil, strong enough to make waves. So you know, it is we are the ones who can change our taunts into cans, right? And we can change our tones into do's, and we can make our dreams into realities and to plans. So um, all of you right here, you are strong. You need to you need to tell you to tell yourself that you deserve the best. I always tell myself I. I'm invincible. You are invincible. You are strong. And you can no one can bend you. No one can break you. Thank you so much everyone.